Hear now the epistle lesson from 1 Corinthians. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Utter foolishness. Utter foolishness. Paul preached the cross of Jesus Christ, and he himself said, it sounds like foolishness in our world today. Foolishness to those who are perishing, but the power of God to those who are being saved. Now, don't be too quick to categorize yourself as a part of the saved, and pointing to some other group as the perishing, because what I have found is this foolish message of the cross often confounds even those who consider themselves religious or on the in crowd. And the reason it confounds is because sometimes we've domesticated the cross, shaped the cross to our own liking, rather than hearing the absolute radical, foolish message of Christ crucified to which Paul is referring here in 1 Corinthians. And so in that sense today, it is very much a foolish sermon because we seek to preach Christ and Him crucified. And like Paul, we need to know the message of that cross for our own lives. Why is it Such a foolish message, this cross of Jesus Christ. Well, first of all, it's foolish because in Christ crucified, God demonstrates sacrificial love. God demonstrates sacrificial love. Now understand, in in the Greek world, in the ancient world, they would have been familiar with gods who demanded a sacrifice. Many of the religions of the day engaged in offering sacrifices to gods, that was familiar. But the idea that a god would become the sacrifice, utter foolishness, completely foolish, that God himself would love us enough to give entirely of himself the fullness of who he was, offer that to us, through his son, Jesus Christ. Some of you have heard me tell in a Bible study setting of a gentleman in my first circuit who was a World War II veteran. And he would tell the story frequently, oftentimes in his testimony, over and over again I heard it. How when he was a young man there in World War II, a grenade came in to where a group of them were. And the leader of his group immediately threw himself on the grenade and absorbed the shrapnel and the shock of the grenade, thereby saving all of those young men who were huddled there together. And I heard him tell that story so many times, but he would always say this, not a day goes by that I don't remember his sacrifice. Not a day goes by that I don't remember his sacrifice. And friends, we should be responding the same way when it comes to this 
message that God himself in Jesus Christ has demonstrated this sacrificial love for us. Not a day should go by, but what we are reminded of the exorbitant, extravagant nature of that sacrificial love. The other thing that was striking about this gentleman is he was so selfless himself. He was so self-giving in his own faith. So do you understand, it wasn't just that he thought about the sacrifice that someone had made on his behalf, but he decided the way to live was to sacrifice on behalf of others. Now that sounds foolish to some people. After all, don't we live in a culture where I'm supposed to protect my own things? I'm supposed to protect my own way. And it's striking to me today that many people consider their viewpoint and their opinion and their ideology as more sacred than their faith. Why? Because we've forgotten the foolish nature of the faith we have. That in Christ, God demonstrates sacrificial love, giving up myself, setting aside my opinion, pushing, pushing out of the point, picture my ideology so that I might sacrifice lovingly on behalf of others. Ken, you're foolish. Yes, it is. It is foolish, friends. But it is the power of God to those who will hear and receive. This foolish notion that in the crucified Christ, God demonstrates, God himself becomes the sacrifice and shows us the way to live out sacrificial love. Secondly, it's foolish because in Christ crucified, God initiates forgiveness of sins. God initiates forgiveness of sins. Now, that God would, that a God would punish sin would have been a familiar notion in the ancient world and certainly among the ancient religions. That occasionally a God would grant a reprieve would be somewhat familiar in the ancient world. But that a God himself would initiate unconditionally and undeservedly forgiveness. No reason, just because of who he is as God, unconditionally, unreservedly, he offers that forgiveness to all people. That's absurd. That's absurd. The requirements of all gods must be met. No, God just says, here's my son. He's the sacrifice. I'm initiating forgiveness. I'm not asking you to get it all together first. I'm not asking you to have your life in order first. God says to us, here's my son. I'm going to forgive you. He initiates that forgiveness for all of us. Friends, that is foolish and absurd because we always think, we, you know, if God's going to forgive me, I've got to earn it some way. I've got to deserve it. That's not the Christian message. In Christ crucified, God is the initiator of forgiveness to us. I read a story a number of years ago, Casey Carlson. He talks about a very dark time in his own life when he had received more than one DUI, and the final time, driving under the influence, he was charged with death because the car that he plowed into was carrying a family, and a young boy in that car died as a result of his actions. Casey Carlson was sentenced to jail. He says, one day I was called because I had a visitor and he said, I went out into the visiting area and I saw a woman that I had only seen one other time. And that was in the courtroom when I was being tried. It was the mother of this young boy. Carlson said, I had no idea what to expect. I picked up the phone. She picked up the phone. We talked through a glass panel. And she looked me right in the eye, Carlson says. And she said, Mr. Carlson, 
I've come to tell you that I forgive you. Carlson said the wave of emotion that went through his mind, his heart, and his soul was indescribable. He said, I could do nothing but weep. Carlson, reflecting upon that event in his life, says, yes, I had heard about forgiveness. Never under any circumstances did I think that kind of forgiveness existed. This mother, due to her faith, no doubt, initiated forgiveness in the direction of Casey Carlson. Did he deserve it? And he would say, of course not. Did he himself think he deserved it? He did not. Did it come unexpectedly to him and ultimately set him free and set him on the right path? Indeed it did, friends. And that's what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. He initiates that forgiveness no matter where I've failed, no matter where I've fallen, no matter how many times I've missed the mark. God forgives and make whole. As one priest was fond of saying, Jesus took people where they were and he loved them into life. Jesus takes us where we are. And because of that great cross event, he loves us into life. He initiates that forgiveness, we receive it, and again, he calls us to offer it then freely to others. Foolish, foolish that God himself would offer forgiveness unconditionally and undeservedly. But friends, that's the message of the cross. If it's not unconditional and undeserved, there would have been no reason for Jesus to go to the cross. None. But God gave his son for you and for me. He initiated that forgiveness. Finally, it's a foolish message because in Christ crucified, God participates fully in our human condition. Part of the meaning of the cross and a very important part of the meaning that sometimes we miss is that in the cross of Jesus Christ, we see a God who participates fully in the human condition. Now, this is perhaps the most foolish of all the notions. The idea that there is a God, certainly familiar to the ancient world, but the idea that a God would become human is utterly ridiculous, totally foolish. But we see it and we see the fullness of of God's humanity at the cross of Jesus Christ. You say, Ken, what do you mean by that? How is it that God's participating in the fullness of our human condition? Well, I remember a story of a physical therapist in one of the Atlanta hospitals. And this physical therapist was known as tops in his field. He was patient. He listened He was more than a physical therapist. Sometimes he was a a counselor and a therapist. The way that he worked with his patients, the way that he moved them towards wholeness and health, no matter how long it took, was exemplary. And once a patient asked one of the nurses who who worked there at the hospital, why is he such a wonderful physical therapist? How does he have such a great reputation. How does he work with people day in and day out? And the nurse simply said, well, we've asked him that too. And the answer is actually pretty simple. He was in an auto accident a number of years ago himself, and it took him two and a half years, two and a half years of rehabilitation, intensive rehabilitation to be made whole again. And then she said this, so he never forgets what it's like to be injured. He never forgets what it's like to be injured. Friends, in the cross of Jesus Christ, we see proclaimed that we serve a God who knows firsthand our pain. He knows firsthand our agony. He knows our suffering. He knows your mockery. He knows the shame. He knows the confusion. He knows the grief. He knows the uncertainty. He even knows about death and mortality. 
And He knows all of these things because of the cross. Therefore, you can trust Him. As we walk through these things ourselves, we can trust Jesus Christ completely because of the cross. And that sounds foolish to some. But friends, as George Everett Ross once said, we come, all of us, to Jesus Christ. We come in our loneliness and our need, and we find out that he was lonely too. We show him our scars. He shows us his. We tell him about the thorns that afflict us, and he tells the story of the thorns upon his brow. We thirst as we walk through a barren and dry land. And we find out that he thirsted as well. Friends, it's upon the basis of our common humanity that God comes to us. And in Christ, amidst it all, offers us his love and a grace that is always sufficient. Friends, it's a foolish message. It really is. That in Christ crucified, God demonstrates sacrificial love, initiates forgiveness, and participates in the fullness of our humanity. But it can be power and strength for your life if you'll look to that cross, place your faith and trust in the one who went there for you, and begin to live the life that he has designed for you to live. Thanks be to God. Amen.